Hello, and welcome to another episode of Envisioneering Exchange, the podcast where industry leaders discuss the most important topics in sustainability, climate change, buildings, and urban efficiency. I'm your host, Vic Marinich, Global Marketing Director at Danfoss. You can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, I'm really excited about today's topic. Today, we have Scott Tew from Train Technologies on the show to talk about circularity, sustainability, and how companies can work together, reduce waste, and lower their carbon emissions. Scott is Vice President Sustainability and Managing Director of the Center for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at Train Technologies. Scott, it's an honor to have you on the show. Can you maybe give us a quick rundown of who Train Technologies is for those who uh, don't know? Yeah, sure, Vic. Thanks for having me on the show today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you and to talk about some of the things that I live every day. First, a quick background on Train Technologies. It is a new company name, but all of your guests will know part of it. Train Technologies is the, the world leader in cooling and heating technologies and innovations. And we've been around for quite some time, at least our brands have. The name Train Technologies was actually a pandemic name. We actually did a transition to a new company brand and enterprise uh, strategy in March of 2020, the same month that the global pandemic COVID-19 took off. Uh, it was great timing in some respects, in other respects, very uh, less than opportune, but it's been an exciting three years. Train Technologies, many of your guests will know us because of our HVAC equipment, which uh, we are really proud to partner with Danfoss on and all of your company's innovations. We are represented in one out of every two buildings in North America and hold a market leadership presence, especially in the commercial space uh, worldwide. Train Residential is in a large section of America's, uh, at least in North America's homes. And then, of course, our Thermal King brand. Some of your guests may recognize Thermal King as the world leader in transport refrigeration units. We transport uh, via refrigerated uh, units. 62% of the world's fresh food every day in more than 140 countries. And so we're really important to perishables being delivered safely to consumers. Part of our perishables that we also are responsible for would include things uh, like vaccines. We're the sole provider, for instance, of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines in every country of the world. And so we've had quite a journey over the past few years as a, a new brand, but also doing some of the things that we've been doing for many decades. So it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's always uh, great to remember that we're talking about the air conditioning and the refrigeration side of things now under the Train Technologies company. So maybe first off, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? Because I think you were really uh, one of the first people in our industry who was really dedicated to looking at sustainability way before it was cool like it is now. Yeah, way before it was cool. And uh, we use that word in very literal senses in my company. So we think being cool is what we do for the world. So yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. It's hard to be thought of as sort of an industry pioneer, but after you've been doing this for as long as I've been doing it, I guess you, I'm wearing that t-shirt proudly now. We did start out quite some time ago, 2009. Our former chairman and CEO began to think about how uh, and ask me, how would we set up a model to begin seeing around corners, around what was emerging in the marketplace in terms of expectations but also just in terms of doing better, as I like to call it, to addressing global challenges. How does a company, a global company in particular, begin to think about the impacts of global challenges, what the company's role is in helping to solve those? And so obviously one of the big global challenges then and now has been climate change. And so Train Technologies and our former company, our former brands were very focused early on on what it meant to address some global challenges like climate change and efficiency. And so that was the the early days of our work. Part of that though, I will say from the very early days has been informed by the facts that uh, heating and cooling and food loss has on the world in terms of negative impacts. Uh, Heating and cooling represents roughly 15% of the world's carbon emissions. And then food loss is another 10% of the world's carbon emissions. And so if you think about it that way, what Train Technologies has seen from the early days has been that roughly 25% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions could be solved or can be solved 
by better solutions from a company just like ours. And so when you began to put things in context and think uh, outside of the company and how you can solve some of these big global challenges, you know, that can change who you are as a company. It can change how you think about products and suppliers and your entire value stream and beyond. So that's part of our story. And that it's always easier to tell a story looking backwards. But when you've been at it as long as we have, uh, the story has just unfolded in some pretty significant milestones along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, 2009, I think it's amazing to think. We're looking, uh, what, 13 years ago. Uh, I think it's also comforting to know that that our industry has been thinking about these kinds of things for so long, even though it's maybe getting on uh, uh, the average citizen's uh, top of mind in the last few years that, that our industry has been at this for, for some time. So at Danfoss, we announced our ESG goals earlier this year, and our focus is to be committed to looking at uh, decarbonization, circularity, and diversity and inclusion. I know Train has a very similar focus. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about the specific commitments Train Technologies is making? Yeah, that's a great question, Vic. And once again, let me congratulate you and the Danfoss team for a set of leading commitments. And we as a company also understand how significant that can be, both the process of arriving at the commitments, these bold commitments, but also in delivering on them. And we think it's really important that companies like Danfoss has done what you've done. We believe that bold commitments drive action. And we've watched that happen in our own company. I know that Danfoss on the back of your previous commitments that your your latest bold commitments would also drive a new level of of actions within your company like it does in ours. The good news is that we're all working together to deliver on both sides of those commitments. I also think that these uh, bold commitments help us all become a better enterprise. They demonstrate industry leadership. They help build a different culture inside the company. I think they help reduce risk in the marketplace with your stakeholders and you know, I think they deliver a different level of value. And the value is around how you engage your own employees, how you'll engage your customers and suppliers, and how you provide growth potential. So bold commitments, in my view, are really critical. And it's great to be partnered with a company like like Dan Foss, who's not shy and has not been afraid to step up and also make bold commitments. But specifically to train technologies commitments, Uh, We actually have a company mission that is to boldly challenge what's possible for a sustainable world. And when that becomes your company's mission, we understand that we know that outside stakeholders, investors, um, non-governmental organizations, customers, even our own employees inside the company are watching for actions and behaviors that are tied to that mission. And so for us, we have three big commitment themes. One is around our products that we call the Gigaton Challenge, and that's to reduce a billion metric tons of emissions from our products by 2030. The second theme is leading by example. This is the one uh, around our operations, our raw materials, our supply chain, and how we manufacture products. And then our third theme is one we call Opportunity for All. And this one is about the workforce of the future that we're creating, as well as how we interact with communities where we have investments and and, uh, infrastructure around the world. So those three themes of commitments were always informed by the megatrends, like I mentioned earlier, megatrends like climate change, could be urbanization. It could be the demand for resources that we believe is becoming much more scrutinized as it should be. And so those types of megatrends informed those big commitment themes that I just mentioned. Wow, fantastic. As I mentioned, right, uh, Danfoss, we've recently announced our ESG goals. And I think decarbonization and diversity and inclusion, right, the names kind of speak for themselves. But circularity, right, some people may not quite uh, be sure what we're talking about there. And we had briefly touched on it in a previous episode of the Envisioneering Exchange. But Can you define maybe a bit better what is circularity and and why is it important to achieving carbon neutrality? Yeah, sure, Vic. I mean, circularity itself is a somewhat simple concept, which is, is a company responsible for every stage of its product life? I mean, that's it in a nutshell. That means, are you being responsible for the materials that you selected to go into the product? Are you being responsible for the design of the product? And are you being responsible for what happens during the product's life, meaning servicing uh, what happens at, at the, near the end of its useful life. 
So it's one thing to say that you're committed to circularity. It's one thing to say that you understand the concept. It's a totally other issue to say that you are tackling all the big aspects of circularity. But our commitment is we're committing to design for circularity. That's our stated public commitment, which itself is a simple half sentence. But as you and your listeners probably know, it's much easier said and maybe understood than done when you start thinking about the raw materials that you select to go into products. And for instance, a great example from our side is that we select and we specify copper, which has to be mined from some mine in South America. It has to go into the product. And so when we start thinking about what's the options or alternatives for selecting a a metal that has to be mined from the earth, is there a better option? Just that one example calls into question almost every other facet of the supply chain and of our value stream. It calls into a, you know, to question the reliability and the quality of the end product. You know, things have to be tested for with alternative materials. It calls into question the parts manufacturer for that system, parts that maybe Danfoss provides to the company, the assembly of those products, the distribution of the products, maybe the warranty itself, the installation, the user experience. And then last but not least, there's this idea around disposal or whether or not anything ever gets disposed, what's the impact there. And so if you think about each of those as a chain in the circularity universe, it takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of um, deep engineering work and design work to think through all the various questions at each step along the way. The good news is is that we've been building a, a process inside the company for the last couple of years with a small team that we call the Circularity Council. And we have redesigned our product design process to take into account for all future products, all of these elements that I just mentioned, so that circularity becomes the norm rather than the exception in the future. So are there any specific areas in production or in the value chain that you've identified as your biggest priorities right now or focus areas? Yeah, that's a fair question. I mean, biggest priorities, you know, we could take any of those elements, like the materials that I mentioned, you could take any of them and you could say that um, we have certainly have identified some priorities like recycled materials, for instance. Can we move to more recycled and renewable materials when we specify raw materials? That's a, a simple and easy to understand question. The fact is that we have to have uh, several teams inside the company work with suppliers to figure out what's possible around recycled materials or renewable materials. If you take things like the sustainable design, which is where we've been working with Danfoss, for instance, on uh, returnables, on packaging, and on the sustainable design, meaning life cycle assessments, so that we understand not just the impact of a given product, but what do we learn from those life cycle assessments? Are there areas that we can revise that would extend the life of the product or maybe reduce the waste in manufacturing the product or maybe just designing for serviceability? Can, Can the product be serviced over its lifetime in a way that's less impactful or more safe for those who are servicing those products? So at every step along the way, we have priorities. So to answer your question, have we set some priorities? We have. We've set them in material selection, like I mentioned, around recyclability. We have set about uh, priorities around reuse and re- redistribution, meaning that the product, could it be a product as a service as opposed to just equipment? Refrigerant reclaim is a great example. Some of your guests will recognize that part of our solutions involves the installation and the inclusion of refrigerants, which are reg- regulated greenhouse gases. And that's the cooling portion of a system. Now we have put in place a a new process for where we reclaim those refrigerants and they are then recycled, put back into the system. And that's to avoid the the new manufacturer of refrigerants in the marketplace. So it's to reduce the overall net of refrigerants in the marketplace. So every step of the process that I've mentioned of a product, we have put priorities in place. And thankfully, we've got Danfoss to thank for helping us with some of those. 
yeah, very interesting uh, work, uh, absolutely, that, that Train Technologies is doing uh, uh, around circularity. And certainly Train Technologies has set some very ambitious uh, goals. And can you talk maybe a bit about those goals focused on circularity and what efforts you're making to achieve them? So as I mentioned, our overall commitment around circularity is design systems for circularity, which we see as an all-encompassing commitment to every facet of the product's life cycle that we can and should be improving on or doing better in the future. So it's everything from material selection to design to maintaining the equipment. Of course, it's manufacturing and assembly, but also it's reuse, it's remanufacturing potential, it's recycling potential. We know that our products are heavily recycled today because of their metal content. However, we'd like to envision a time when it's not just about recycling, it's also about maybe a repurposing of those products in the future. So in other words, our commitment is a full circle. It's around all everything from materials to design to the services at the at the end of a product's useful life. And so we have a team fully focused on all of that. We have metrics in place that will new metrics that we'll be announcing in 2023 related to this. But you know, we're really pleased to be partnering with Dan Foss on some of the elements of our circularity journey. Now, these uh, goals that you've set, you've set them according to uh, science-based targets. And, and at Danfoss, we think that's also uh, very important. But can you maybe explain why Train Technologies has also decided to set your goals according to science-based targets and why that's so important? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So we firmly believe that targets and commitments should not exist in some vacuum inside of a company. Uh, we believe that the extra scrutiny of inviting others outside the company to view your plans, the targets to ensure that, number one, they're impactful enough for next generation. And when I mean next generation, I mean forward-looking, future-looking performance. We do that around finances, and it's high time that companies ask others outside of a company to view their sustainability and ESG targets in the same light. So we turn to the SBTI group, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, to understand and get their feedback on our commitments around our carbon emissions reductions. I'm really honored and pleased that we have received validation for our scopes one and two targets, as well as our scope three, our product related targets. We've also recently been validated for our net zero targets. We were only company number 11 to receive validation for our net zero targets out of the thousands of companies that, have, that are working with SBTI only a handful have received the full validation to the very end. And what I mean by very end is net zero. And so we really appreciate companies like Danfoss following the same path of having their targets also validated as science-based. Congratulations on really Thank you. setting the stage for the marketplace there when it comes to ESGs and following these science-based targets. So we've talked about a lot of things that Train Technologies has uh, been doing, and it's fantastic. We've been doing it since 2009. But of course, Train Technologies is a huge global company with a lot of resources that you can bring to bear on these kinds of issues. Uh, but maybe not every company that, that's listening today or every person listening today has those same resources. So they can probably pretty easily become overwhelmed, right, with thinking about where to start, what to do, right, how do they get uh, things going. So uh, can you maybe make uh, some recommendations on how a company can uh, get started on reducing waste, right? What are the first steps they should be taking? That's a fair question, Vic. And I think any company of any size, small, medium, large, global, or one city-based company, it doesn't matter the size or complexity. I think every company can work towards doing something better. I mean, I think the core of sustainable thinking is about continuous improvement. And so I think that any company can look for ways that they are doing whatever they're doing today in the marketplace. They can do it better in the future than they did it in the past. One of the things that we're seeing now is that companies are moving away from this thinking of what I would call incremental thinking that will do less bad than last year. You know, there was a time where that was the thinking was, we'll just be less bad than last year. They're, the thinking today, I think the prevailing thinking is, how do we actually be net positive? How do we actually have a positive impact in all the areas that we operate as a company? Now, if you take on that mentality, if you take on that lens as a company, no matter the size, I think it may help you think through things in terms of how you treat your people and the communities that you operate, 
how you think about your products and what they're solving for your customers, how you think about all the other elements of who you work with, you know, who are your partners on the supplier side. I think it can help you rethink your priorities in a way that's going to be a better outcome for all parties involved. And so that's where we're going. You know, if I were giving advice to any company, number one is there's a thousand things you can focus on, but that's just too many. So you have to find a way. And there are certain tools available to help you focus on the things that are most important. And you have to come up with a handful of things that are you believe are most important for your company. And that's where you set the bold commitments. And every company can focus on a handful of issues to tackle. And every company can set a big, bold commitment about how it's going to go after and tackle that issue and solve something for itself and for its customers. And I'm a firm believer in that no matter the size of the company. So I'm glad you asked the question. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. Like you said, no matter the size, we can all do something better tomorrow than how we're doing it today. On the train technology side, I mean, you talked a bit about you're really looking at your scope one, two, and three emissions, right? So that means you've got to look both up and down your value chain, talking with suppliers, talk with customers. How did train technology start that dialogue? And how did you start setting up those kinds of relationships with customers and suppliers? Yeah, I mean, collaboration is really key to making um, big progress in all of the, in any of these areas. One of the areas is to find out what's expected of your partners and that requires you asking the right questions outside the company. The other is working with partners like Danfoss on solving something together, whether it's uh, reducing waste then the shipment of supplies, or it's collaborating in terms of how do we work together on innovation for product outcomes. We do both of those with Danfoss in terms of providing reduced waste and shipping with packaging or in a host of areas there, but also we do collaborations with Danfoss and, and other key suppliers in terms of innovations. You know, we want to know what are the innovations that Danfoss is making with their products that we should know about to incorporate into our product design. So that's a collaboration because working together, we can reduce efficiencies, we can do, reduce waste, we can extend the life of the product. We may be able to solve other outcomes for customers that uh, separately we can't do. We find that often working with companies like Danfoss. And so we're really appreciative of that. But no matter the area of ESG or sustainability, no matter these challenges, I think collaboration is the name of the game. Collaboration is key to us getting there. Scott, I think you bring up a really good point about how we need to collaborate. And I think it's also important, the sooner the better. Everybody knows kind of the direction everybody's going. We can collaborate and innovate together to really get the right products to the market uh, at the right time. So that all sounds good, of course, but uh, have you encountered any uh, unforeseen challenges so far in the planning and implementation of your uh, goals? That's a good question. I think uh, every company encounters some challenges here, right? One of ours, and it still is a challenge, is just collecting enough data to make good decisions or product-related commitments around reducing a billion metric tons of greenhouse gases means that we need to be calculating as specific as possible where the reductions are occurring when we install a product somewhere in the world. And saying that's easier than doing it. We want to account for all the factors, the real factors of the system. You know, what's the capacity? What's the refrigerant that's used? Where is it being installed? On what type of energy grid in the world? All those things are important to calculating it accurately, getting that data in a timely manner, and making sure that that data is complete is another question. So that's what we've been working on is making sure we that we do that. The other is just the complexities of life cycle assessments, as the Danfoss team knows, because you're working with us on some of those. Those take time. They take up energy and resources, people. They take us, once again, gathering the right data from the right entities that own that data and then collaborating to get it all together so we have a full picture of the impact of a product's life. And so, yeah, that probably are the two biggest challenges, just the resources required in terms of time resources, but also just in making sure that all the places this data may exist, that we are gathering it from the right sources. We're also trying to follow certain standards that have been set outside of our company. And that says that there's a framework in place and we want to follow that standard as closely as possible. But in the world of sustainability, these standards are not fully comprehensive. 
They're not made for products like Danfoss and Train Technologies make. And so we have to origami our way into a standard so that we follow as much of the framework as possible. All those things are complications. They're not something we can't overcome together, but they are certainly a challenge that we have to work on together. Fantastic discussion, Scott. I really appreciate it. We could probably sit here for an hour more discussing, but obviously we want to be uh, respectful to your time. So I'll hit you with just one final big question here. So have you got any advice or best practices that you can share with some of the companies as they're just kicking off their efforts here? Like, you know, there's no better time to start than today. And I can tell you that um, not being fearful, but looking outside your company, trying to understand what a true best practice looks like that meets the most expectations possible in the marketplace, whether we're talking customers or investors or others, that's the way to get started. You know, no matter the company, getting started is always the hardest part of the journey. And, you know, finding out from others what true best practice is, I think is a great recipe for success. Fantastic, great. So that's it for this episode of Envisioneering Exchange. I'd like to thank my guest, Scott Tew, Vice President Sustainability and Managing Director for the Center of Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at Train Technologies for joining us. Thank you, Vic. It's been a pleasure. Don't forget to subscribe to Envisioneering Exchange on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate, review, and share it with your network. Thanks for listening and talk to you next time. This podcast is for information purposes only. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Envisioneering Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and not necessarily represent those of Danfoss LLC and its employees. Danfoss LLC is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the podcast series available for listening on this site. This podcast series does not constitute professional advice or services. This podcast, including Danfoss LLC and the producers, disclaim responsibility from any possible adverse effects of information contained herein. Opinion of guests are their own, and Dan Foss LLC in this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility of statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about the guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast. The developers of the Envisioneering Exchange podcast site assume no liability for any activities in connection with this podcast or for use of this podcast in connection with any other website website, computer, or playing device.